All right, man, peace. So, brothers, this is going to be my review of the two-part blockbuster cinematic extravaganza that I call the Avengers Infinity Gauntlet series, that being Avengers Infinity War and Avengers Endgame. And, brothers, let me get to the point. What you witnessed, if you happen to see those two films, was a modern retelling of the ancient tale pertaining to the Titans versus the Olympians. In other words, how did Zeus and the pantheon of Olympian gods, quote unquote, overcome the Titans led by Kronos, i.e. Saturn, a.k.a. Thanos? That's all that film was actually about. And when you view the Avengers, the Avengers are just a modern day metaphor or an analogy for the ancient Olympians, the quote unquote Greek gods of Mount Olympus. And we're going to go through that sequence by sequence, as well as the quote unquote Infinity Gauntlet being a parable or metaphor for the six days of creation. So brothers, the megalomaniacal villain of the Infinity War series is Thanos. We all know that by now because there are probably only two or three people on the planet Earth who have not seen <laughs> who have not seen the Avengers films. I've heard people say that Thanos represents the most high or that he represents Christ. No, he does not. He represents the planet Saturn or the god Saturn, I should say. And by conjunction the planet Saturn as well. Also known as Kronos also known as the quote-unquote god of death, Thanatos. That is who Thanos represents. Now what they will do with the character of Thanos is they will apply certain characteristics of Christ or the Most High of the Bible to him because they want you to conflate those two ideologies once again. The Luciferians that control the entertainment industry, they want people to believe that the story of Christ is just a copy or a mimic of the story of Heru or of Saturn or of Sar, or of Tammuz, so on and so forth. So they will always add components that will allude to the scriptures. Like, for example, Thanos has four horsemen. He has four agents of death that he sends out to attack the Avengers and the people of the world. Also, in Avengers Endgame, he descends from the clouds with a sword in his hand. There are moments in Avengers Infinity War where he appears out of a black smoke or out of the black cloud. Like the scriptures tell you the Most High does when he speaks with the High Priest or with Solomon. They do this on purpose so that you can combine or conflate within the subconscious of your mind that Saturn or Thanos is Christ. That's how they program you in most of those films. As I stated in the video that I did for Captain Marvel. Right now the Marvel Cinematic Universe is used for mass spell casting. They want to cast spells on the masses because they know that millions of people are going to see these films. And that's how they're going to entice you to accept certain ideologies, certain philosophies pertaining to Luciferianism. But once again, Thanos is Saturn. He's the quote unquote God Saturn or Kronos. That's why he's known as the Mad Titan. The story of the Avengers against Thanos is the story of the Olympians led by Zeus going against Kronos or the Titan. Remember, Kronos or Titan attempted to swallow his children. And his wife Rhea was able to get him to swallow a stone and thereafter vomit up his children. When you get an understanding of that story, that's actually talking about Adam. The children represented the fruit that Adam ingested. That's why the quote unquote God Saturn was always known as being morose or depressed or downtrodden. Because that was, that was a metaphorical retelling of the story of Adam. That was the nation's version of Adam. But just to get back to the point, whenever you see Thanos, he'll be depicted as... An entity who was obsessed with death and destruction. Because that was the job of the quote-unquote God Saturn. He was the thresher. His job was to destroy and then rebuild. Also notice that when the Avengers finally caught up with Thanos on the planet that he was located on. After he had killed half the population of the quote-unquote universe. What was he doing? He was farming. Because Saturn or Kronos is the god of the grain. And they put him to death. And before they put him to death, notice that he was extremely morose. He was very depressed. Once again, Thanos is not Christ. Thanos is Saturn. I've seen many people trying to claim that Thanos represents Christ. And, you know, some of the statements that people make are marginally correct. Because as I've stated in the past, what they do in some of these superhero films, or many of these quote-unquote blockbusters, is they'll make the hero of the film the villain, and they'll make the villains the heroes. The job of the Avengers, who are, who are idols, who represent false gods, their job is to preserve the Luciferian world that we currently live in. That's their job. That's why they're globalists. 
So brothers, this is an alleged ancient depiction of the quote-unquote god Thanatos, who's the inspiration for Thanos. Now could this be an actual ancient depiction? Who knows? When I look at this, this sculpture, the entity here seems to have Caucasoid features. The ancient Greeks were people of color, so this most likely is another museum forgery, as about 90% of all the artifacts in the museums are forgeries. But just to get to the point, this is the quote-unquote god of death, Thanatos, and he's always depicted with the sword. That's why I stated that if you pay very close attention to the film Avengers Endgame, Thanos descended out of the clouds with the sword in his hand to do battle. So brothers, this is a revised depiction of the Titan, the quote-unquote god Kronos or Saturn, who as we can see is attempting to eat a baby. This is where the Luciferians slash Satanists or the Luciferians and the Satanists, I should say, get the practice of cannibalism from, particularly pertaining to a baby. A very good example of a film that depicts the cannibalism of infants as a part of Luciferian practices is the film Mother, starring Jennifer Lawrence. If you brothers get a chance, you should check that out. At the very end of the film, it's revealed, unbeknownst to Jennifer Lawrence's character, that she's married to, a, to an elite level occultist. And he's impregnated her just so that she can bring their baby to term. And the baby can thereafter get torn apart by many other members of the cult. And there's an attempt made to ingest the baby or eat the baby. But you brothers can check that out for yourself. That goes back to the veneration of Saturn or Kronos. So brothers, this entity here, Thanos, he seeks to assemble the six quote-unquote infinity stones. And as we know, the term infinity is an allusion to who? The infinite one. There's only one infinite one, that being the most high. So Thanos seeks out these six stones to become like the most high, to be able to control all aspects of the quote-unquote space-time continuum. Whether it be the time stone, the mind stone, the power stone, the space stone, the reality stone, the soul stone, whichever it is, he wants to bring all aspects of the space-time continuum together so that he can control every aspect of it. And thereafter, he can fulfill his incessant need, his insatiable thirst to kill half the universe and thereafter recreate everything in his image, force a renewal. That is the inherent nature of Saturn, the quote-unquote god of the reaping or of the harvest. And, you know, just like we see in the scriptures, for example, in Matthew, the 13th chapter, it tells us about the harvest and the reapers and the angels are the reapers. The other nations, they had those same analogies. They had those same metaphors. It's just that they applied it to their false entities, their false deities. When we look at Thanos here, he has the infinity gauntlet. So he has control of all. The Avengers, the false gods of this world, the Olympians, they have to take it from him so that they can take him out of power. And once again, it's very obvious to me that the six stones represent the six days of creation. And on the seventh day, the Most High rested. Now, what did Thanos do after he finally completed his task? He rested. Because as Saturn, remember, as Saturn, the seventh day is the day of rest. That's where we get the term or the name for the day Saturday from or the quote-unquote Black Sabbath, the day of rest for the god Saturn, or Kronos. After he completed his mission, he rested. So, brothers, now I'm just going to go through some of the main characters, person by person, or personage by personage, and do the comparison to the corresponding Olympian that they're meant to represent. In the case of Tony Stark, he's the great craftsman, the great builder, the great creator of artifices and things of that nature, technology, so on and so forth. He is proverbial Hephaestus, a.k.a. Ptah. He's also known as Vulcan, or that quote-unquote god was also known as Vulcan, the god of fire, the god of invention, the quote-unquote god of technology of his day. He was the great ironsmith. That is who Tony Stark represents amongst the quote-unquote Avengers. He's the great ironsmith, a.k.a. Iron Man. He builds the technology not just for himself, but for everyone in the group, that being War Machine, Remember, his father was the person who created Cap's shield for him. We're going to get to Cap in a moment. Tony Stark invented a suit of armor even for his lady. He invented a suit for Spider-Man. Remember, in the Age of Ultron film, he was conspiring to build a suit of armor for the entire planet Earth. He actually built Ultron. So he is the great creator, the great craftsman. But let's prove that. This, of course, is Tony Stark from the now classic 
original Iron Man film from 2008 when he was trapped in a cave in Afghanistan. Remember, he was there because the quote unquote terrorists were trying to convince him to build bombs and weaponry for them. He had been doing so for the American government. As we can see here, he is a great ironsmith. He's in the process of building the first Iron Man suit of armor. Now, please pay attention and compare that to the quote unquote Olympian god Hephaestus, aka Vulcan, the god of fire and invention. Same image, right? That was the purpose of Hephaestus, or his purpose was as the great craftsman. He built weaponry for Zeus, he built the trident for Poseidon. I believe he, he made armor for the god Ares, and we're going to find out who Ares is very soon. Hephaestus was also married to Aphrodite, the quote-unquote goddess of love. And we're going, to, we're going to investigate that dynamic between Hephaestus and Aphrodite and where Ares fits in. And what the reason is for the contention that we see in the film between certain prominent Avengers. But once again, Iron Man is Hephaestus or Vulcan. Okay, so now brothers, take a look at this screenshot photo that I've just taken of the quote-unquote Roman god Vulcan. As we can see, the author or the scribe of this article understands that one of the pseudonyms of the quote-unquote god Vulcan or Hephaestus is as the Iron Man. Once again, that is where Stan Lee got the idea of the character of Tony Stark, the Iron Man, from. He is the great forge, the great ironsmith for the Olympian gods. That is who the Avengers are. So let's see what this article states. The statue is located in Birmingham, Alabama. And it says, on the summit of Red Mountain overlooking downtown Birmingham, stands a 56-foot statue of Vulcan, blacksmith of the Roman gods. What is a pagan colossus doing on the buckle of the Bible belt? That's a very good question that the author of this article is asking. Unbeknownst to this person, America is governed by the energies of the quote-unquote ancient gods of Kemet and Babylon. It's just that they'll never depict these entities as being of derivation or origin from Kemet or Babylon, a.k.a. Sumer, because what's taught in the school system is that the Greco-Roman civilization was predominantly Caucasian. So that's why they're always going to lean towards the quote-unquote Greco-Roman interpretation for these gods, quote-unquote gods, as opposed to saying that this is Pata, or what have you, or Ogun. But that's a whole other video. Point being is this. This is confirmation that the character of Iron Man is Vulcan or Hephaestes, in all actuality, Pata, from the ancient Kemetic religion or the mystery school system. So brothers, one more thing about Tony Stark. This notion, this erroneous belief that he's dead. <laughs> the Avengers, the Marvel Cinematic Universe is one long soap opera. It's an action fantasy soap opera. That's why people get so caught up in it. When the MCU first started, it was mostly comic book people who went to see the films. And the reason why those movies made so much money is because a lot of young boys went to see it and their mothers and fathers took them to see the film. And many of their fathers collected comics when they were young, so they were familiar with the characters. Keep in mind that characters like Iron Man and the Hulk go back to the 1960s, early 60s. Captain America goes back to the 1940s. So there are people out here who are 80 years old, 90 years old, grew up on Captain America. Tony Stark also represents transhumanism. The melding of man and machine. This is mankind's latest ploy to achieve some level of immortality. And their belief is that through transhumanism, that being the melding of the flesh and the robotic, or what they call bionic implants, that you can extend man's lifetime and make him like a god. That is who the character archetype of Tony Stark is supposed to represent as well. The transhumanist. That's a term that was coined by Julian Huxley back in, I think, the late 40s or early 50s. I'm sure that many of you brothers already know who that is, but for those of you who don't, you should look him up. His name is Julian Huxley. He officially coined the term transhumanism. He did not invent the idea, but he coined the term. And that is the ideology that Iron Man is meant to project or encapsulate, really, in the, in the Avengers saga, the transhumanist. As we can see... By the end of the series, he's just as much machine as he is man. The Iron Man costume is literally a part of him. And he's powered by the technology of the Tesseract. Really, all the Avengers owe much of who they are to the Tesseract or one of the Infinity Stones. 
That's why they're the only ones who could conquer Thanos, the Titan, because they were born of the same energies that he was wielding. Once again, they represent the Olympian gods. But as I was saying, Tony Stark will be back in some manifestation. Either they'll bring him back from the dead in some way, shape, or form because he's mostly machine, or they'll represent him as some manifestation of artificial intelligence. And beyond that, they wanted him removed from the saga anyway, and I'll be getting to that somewhere down the line in this video, because he represents an archetypal male figure, and they don't want those type of figures presiding over the MCU anymore. They're moving over to the Divine Feminine. Okay, so brothers, very quickly, I also want to address a certain aspect of the film Avengers Endgame, that being the much-repeated line, I love you 3000. <laughs> A lot of these Iron Man Marvel Cinematic Universe fans are saying that phrase to one another all over the internet. For you brothers out there who are interested, the reason why they snuck that line into the script is because the number 3000, and I may have alluded to this in the video that I did on Outcast, that number 3000 is a direct allusion to the quote unquote Aeon of Heru or Horus. All of these top directors and producers in Hollywood and actors are all Crowleyites or Thelemites, whatever you want to call that phrase. What do I mean by the term Crowleyite or Thelemite? They follow Thelema, the book of the law, which says, do what thou wilt, and the law is love, so on and so forth. So when you see one of these directors and producers, they get on TV, if they're at an award ceremony, they grab the microphone and they say, it's all about love, love cures all, love conquers all. They're not talking about the love of the Bible. They're not even talking about emotional love. They're talking about the quote-unquote love of Lucifer or the love of Heru. Because Heru, according to the dictates of Aleister Crowley, was quote-unquote prophesied to have a 1,000-year reign, starting circa the year 2000. Okay? So when you see them sneak those lines or those names, those catchphrases, into a movie or into a script where they're constantly trying to highlight that that term or that number 3000 Heru is who they're saluting okay Tony Stark aka Robert Downey Jr. is a Saturnian notice at the very end of the film his last line was I am Iron Man there was a pause there between the I am and the Iron Man because that once again was a signifier to those in the know the proverbial quote-unquote gods, a.k.a. the Saturnians or Luciferians or high-level Masons, witches, etc., who worship themselves as a god. Robert Downey Jr. was saying, I am a god now because I have on the Infinity Gauntlet. And in real life, he considers himself a god as well because, once again, in order for you to ascend up the ranks in Hollywood, which is a witch coven, you have to venerate Lucifer. And when you ascend to the highest level of the Saturnian belief system, you become a microcosm of the quote-unquote demiurge, Saturn or Saturnus himself. And for those of you who don't know, Lucifer is the triumvirate or that three-part quote-unquote god entity of the horned father god, the mother goddess, and their son. That is what I'm referring to when I say Luciferian. In order for you to ascend up the ranks in Hollywood or any form of entertainment or in elite circles per se, you have to be a venerator of Lucifer. Once again, that is the horned father god, the mother goddess, and their son. When I say the horned father god, I'm talking about Pan or Baal. When I say the mother goddess, I'm talking about Isis or Ishtar or Inanna or Juno or Hera, whatever you want to call that entity, Aphrodite. And when I say the son, I'm talking about Heru or Attis or Tammuz or Adonis. What we saw at the very end of the film were the Olympians finally able to conquer Kronos or Saturn per se the titan that's all that was but just getting back to the point that term i love 3000 is really i love lucifer that's what that means and they'll sneak it in like the rapper andre 3000 he's a luciferian that's why the name of their rap group was called outcast you had big boy and you had andre 3000 big boy is an allusion to the quote-unquote boy god harpocrates or herupa Karet, also known as cupid also known as Plutus or Pluto. Okay? That's how they sneak these things in <laughs> into these major motion pictures. They knew that Avengers Endgame was going to break box office records. So, so there were going to be a litany of spells that would be cast on the audience in a major motion picture like that. And that's what occurred. But once again, when Robert Downey Jr.'s character of Tony Stark says, I am, 
and then he pauses for that very long <laughs> intermission and then ends it with Iron Man. He's saying that he is a god. As you'll see, if you follow some of these um, these characters, these so-called celebrities on social media, their Twitter handle or their Facebook or their Instagram, sometimes they'll have that handle, I am such and such or I am so and so. They're letting you know that they're a Luciferian. They're letting you know that they're a Mason, particularly those who are in the entertainment industry. So a basic person or a regular person who says, well, what about me? I am John Smith. I'm on Twitter. Am I a Luciferian too? No, you're not. You're just a regular person. Okay, no disrespect. But that's how they encode a lot of their allegiances. So, brothers, next we have Mr. Captain America, a.k.a. Steve Rogers, played by Chris Evans. Who does Captain America represent? He represents the quote-unquote Greek god of war, Ares. That is why he has that A on his forehead. They claim that A stands for America. I believe that the A stands for two things. Anarchy, as well as the quote-unquote god, Ares. Remember, the concept of rulership in this society is order out of anarchy. You understand that? So Captain America, his narrative over the course of the MCU is that he realizes that there are different shades of gray. There's nuance. And as he learns to comprehend the nuance, he starts to lose a lot of the fervor that he has to be a fighter. If you notice, Captain America is always characterized as a character who leads with his fists. He does not think. He's a thinker. He has a good brain. But he believes that he can solve every problem with his fists and with his combat. Because he is the quote-unquote Greek god Ares, also known as the Roman god Mars. And that is why he's always going back and forth with Hephaestus or Vulcan. Because they had that same level of contention in the ancient Greek pantheon. That's why they transferred it over to the modern manifestation, that being the Avengers. So brothers, this was a promotional still shot for the film Captain America Civil War. This is when the antipathy between the character of Captain America and the character of Iron Man finally came to a boil. But notice how they have the shield framed. They have it framed so that the pentagram on his shield is fully inverted for the quote-unquote gold head, a.k.a. the Baphomet or Pan or what have you. And that has always been what Captain America actually represented. He just never understood that. And that was the tone, that was the overall theme of the Avengers series. Remember, when Cap thought he was fighting for America, he was fighting for the good guys. And then come to find out, as an agent of S.H.I.E.L.D., he was fighting for Hydra the whole time. Hydra was meant to be an analogy for the inner sanctum of the Nazis, known as the Knights of the Black Sun. You understand that? That's why in the great film Captain America Civil War, the Nazi doctor broke it down for Captain America when, uh, when he and Black Widow, a.k.a. Athena, were in the warehouse and they went down to the basement. The Nazi doctor, or at least the artificial intelligence version of him, broke it down for Captain America. And that was probably some foreshadowing for how they're going to present Tony Stark. Once again, the character of Iron Man is not going to go away. But just to get back to Captain America here, he is Ares. And in his character arc, as he starts to understand that there's no such thing as true, just good and just evil, he starts to become less zealous because he's not quite sure of who he's fighting for and why he's fighting in the first place. And that's how his character starts to develop. And eventually he's able to let go of, of the passion and the, the fervency of the cause that really only existed in his head the whole time. That's when he was ready to go back and be with his woman, be with his lady. But, you know, we're going to cover certain aspects of Captain America in a minute. Now, this is the ancient version of the character known today as Captain America. This is Ares or Mars. And as we can see here, he has the shield. In the ancient world, his shield was called Ansel, spelled A as in Apple, N as in Nancy, C as in Charlie, I as in India, L as in Larry, E as in Edward. And as we can see, this is the ancient version of the character that we call today Captain America. He has the magical shield. And once again, he was also known as being the quote-unquote hot-headed god of war. This is another depiction of Ares or Mars. And what is it that stands out? He has the shield. 
So, brothers, this is the character known as the Black Widow. She represents the modern manifestation of the quote-unquote goddess of war, Athena, also known as Minerva. In ancient Rome, she was known as Minerva. Not only was she the goddess of war, she was also the goddess of wisdom. That's why you'll notice, in contrast to Ares, her brother, and this is why if you, if you pay attention, they always link up Captain America and, and, and Black Widow. Because their rapport is more like brother and sister than anything sexual in nature. She's meant to balance out a lot of his headstrong nature. He always wants to fight. He wants to go straight ahead. She's ready to use more subterfuge because, once again, she's the goddess of wisdom. She's the quote-unquote goddess of tactics. She is Athena. Now, supposedly, they're supposed to be making a standalone Black Widow prequel film. I'm not quite sure how they're going to do that. <laughs> because Scarlett Johansson is aging like spoiled milk. I mean, damn. Look at Scarlett Johansson. At one time, she was considered a looker. But that's what happens when you embrace those super feminist, super liberal ideologies. It just ages your face like hell, man. Because, whew, good Lord. Soccermom.com. Now, this is how Scarlett Johansson used to look. This is how she looked in the first Avengers film. Cats might say, well, damn, bro, it's been seven years. People going to age. I get it. But she's not even, I'm not even quite sure if she's 35 yet. The broad looks 45. But if you're paying close attention, when you saw her in the film Avengers Endgame, they were trying to post her as the leader. They were trying to post her as someone of wisdom who could control the situation, so on and so forth. There's more, than, there's more than one reason why they did that. Number one is because she's Minerva. Number two is because, once again, they're trying, to, they're trying to create a paradigm shift in the MCU where every person of prominence is a woman. And when, <laughs> I say this over and over and over again. If you dudes out there do not say something to stop it, they will do the same thing to the Marvel Cinematic Universe that they did to ESPN and other subsidiaries and outlets that was controlled by Disney, which is the largest witch coven on the planet Earth. They're going to try to get you to, to venerate the horn god and the mother goddess. For the masses, everything is supposed to be worship the feminine principle. So now this is the quote-unquote ancient deity Athena. This is who the character archetype of the Black Widow is based on. She's the quote-unquote goddess of war. Whenever you see the Avengers at war, Black Widow, she's ready to go all out. But she's a thinker. She's a conniver. Unlike Captain America, who's not particularly conniving. He likes to go headfirst into every battle. You know, he leads the charge. Now, just to get back to the original sentiment that I stated pertaining to both Captain America and the Black Widow. They are Ares and Athena, brother and sister. That's why they're always paired in any Avengers movie that you see, the both of them together, or Captain America movie, they're always paired up with one another. This is in, I believe, The Winter Soldier. This, I believe, was in the Avengers Infinity War. This also was in the Infinity War movie. They're always next to one another. Because the energy pertaining to them is of Ares and Athena. What most of these screenwriters do is... They have a basic framework that they have to work within. They work within that Olympian framework or the ancient mythos framework. And then they just flesh it out. Everything is just a redo. People talk about movie remakes today. <laughs> They're not remaking movies from 20 years ago. They're remaking sagas from 4,000 years ago. Okay? That's how they get you to worship the pagan gods in a roundabout way. That's why also in most of these Marvel Cinematic Universe films... They'll find some way to try to attack the belief in the Most High or the belief in the Christ of the Bible. That's what they're using these films for, is to get people to embrace Luciferianism and the left-hand path. So, brothers, this is a relatively modern uh, rendition or depiction in sculpture form of Ares and Athena. They're always hand-in-hand hand because they're both quote-unquote deities of war. In the same way, in the Avengers films, they make sure that Captain America and the Black Widow are hand-in-hand, hand, their partners. So, brothers, as I'm sure most of you know, this is the character Loki, the quote-unquote Norse god of mischief. He acts as the counterbalance to his alleged brother, Thor. They both act as 
quote unquote sons of Odin. Loki represents the left hand path, Thor the quote unquote right hand path, even though they're both just manifestations on the opposite sides of the coin of the same Luciferian principle. The point being is this I want you brothers to pay very close attention to his attire and also the staff that's in his hand. Because as we can see, he has the horns on his head to represent him as the quote unquote divine bull, whether it be the Apis bull, Asar, or Osiris. Or the Bacchus, who was also represented by the bull. We also know that Baal was represented by the bull. So they let you understand certain things or they tip you off to certain things in these films if you know what you're looking at. Loki also has the staff in his hand, the scepter, with the quote unquote mind stone in it. And that scepter is supposed to be an allusion to the scepter of the craftsman god Ptah. The scepter known as the Was, spelled W-A-S. Let's take a look at it for a moment. This is the quote unquote craftsman god Ptah, who was depicted as being green skinned. Why is that? Because all of these so called Kemetic or Sumerian gods are just various aspects of the same two or three entities. But as we can see here, he has the same staff in his hand. It even has the same headpiece on it as the quote unquote scepter of Loki with the mind stone in it. That staff represented authority and power. Once again, it's spelled W-A-S, the WAS. Let me just do a close up for a moment. You see there, the head of it is the same as the head of the scepter that Loki had. The only difference is that Loki, <laughs> Loki had the mind stone in his. So brothers, the character of the Vision made his debut in the Avengers Age of Ultron film. He was, the, he was basically the amalgamation of all the best aspects of all the Avengers. And he also had the Mind Stone installed, which basically galvanized him or empowered him. At the end of the film Age of Ultron, he was actually able to kill Ultron, who also represented a quote-unquote Christ-like figure who the Avengers had to destroy. The point being is this, we know that we know that the vision descended himself from the artificial intelligence known as Jarvis, who was what? He was a helper to Tony Stark, also known as Hephaestes or Vulcan. Now the helper to Hephaestes was what or who? The Cyclops. And in, and in the same way that the vision is the physical personification of Jarvis, and he has the mind stone in the middle of his head representing the illuminated third eye. We know that the Cyclops also had a third eye that was represented in a metaphorical way as he was the helper of Hephaestus. Let's see how it looks. So once again, the vision is the modern rendition of the Cyclops. The Cyclops was also known as the great builder, the great artificer, the great inventor, because he was an aide to Hephaestus or Vulcan in the same way that Jarvis was an aide to Iron Man or Tony Stark. So brothers, now we're up to Wanda Maximoff. And it shouldn't be that difficult for brothers to be able to know which ancient deity she's supposed to be a modernized version of once we just look at her name. Her name is what? The Scarlet Witch. Who's the goddess of witchcrafts who always dressed in scarlet? None other than Isis herself. As we can see, that is who the Scarlet Witch is. She's a modernized version of Isis or Aset, the quote-unquote scarlet or red-dressed version or the red-dressed goddess of witches or witchcraft. Now we see her brother, quote-unquote Quicksilver. This is another easy one because as we know in the ancient world, you had the god, the quote-unquote god known as Hermes. This is Hermes. He was the great messenger god of the quote-unquote pantheon of the Olympians. He would go from the heavens to the regular world where the humans dwell to the underworld all in a flash. And that's also, by the way, where you get the character of the Flash from in the DC universe. It's the same thing. I can go through all the characters, the mainstream characters in the DC universe and tell you who their, their pagan mythological counterparts are or who their pagan inspirations are as well. But that would be another video for another day. But once again, Quicksilver is Mercury or Hermes. And brothers, don't you know that in alchemy, the metal for the planet Mercury is what? Quicksilver. 
That's where it all comes from. That's how you know that Stan Lee is a Kabbalist. Because for him, for him to know this stuff and to always make some type of correlation between his characters and those entities, he had to be, he had to be very knowledgeable. Okay, so now we're going to address the quote-unquote god of thunder, that being Thor, who comes from the ancient Norse mythology, one of the sons of Odin. And sometimes he, he gets conflated with the god of war, Tyr, because they're basically the same, the same entity. How do you know that? Well, in the ancient Greek, the word for the planet Mars is Thoros, which is meant to be an allusion to Thor, who is also known in other cultures as Zorro. As the name was transplanted, they changed the Z to a TH. So that's where we get the term or the name Thor from, the planet Mars or the god of war, which is another name for Heru. Heru was also known as the god of war. All right. So as we can see here, Thor was also known as the storm god. We see, we see a relatively extreme degradation of his character in the film Avengers Endgame because that's part of the Endgame. And I'll be getting to what that term Endgame actually is an allusion to at the end of this video. But it was very obvious why they had Thor's character get so sloppy. He revealed it near the end. He has to pass off a lot of his powers to the other, to the other archetype, to the other principle. No longer the masculine principle. Everything has to go towards the feminine principle. So, brothers, this is Thor's hammer, as we all know, or as it's depicted in the film. I believe the name is Mjolnir. Well, Mjolnir was just a metaphor for the sun wheel. That's what the hammer was meant to be an allusion to or a metaphor for. The sun wheel, the divine power of the quote-unquote sun god. This is an ancient depiction of Mjolnir, or Thor's hammer. And it was intermixed with the swastika. The swastika, for those of you brothers who don't know, I'm sure that many of you already know this, but the swastika was a sun symbol before the Nazis abducted it, and it now is, is correlated with white supremacy and so, so on and so forth. But originally it was just a sun symbol. And as we can see here, they have the hammer of Thor rotating around the sun wheel, which is itself stuck inside of the image of the quote-unquote black sun for Saturn. Thor is a Saturnian, as I already stated in previous videos. The planet Asgard is just Saturn. That's all it is. And Thor even breaks that down in the first Thor film when he's explaining the Nine Realms to the character played by Natalie Portman. He shows her the Nine Realms and he says this is Asgard. And he's pointing to the, the shape or the figure that represents Saturn. Okay? So that's where he comes from. That's why they utilize the rainbow bridge known as the Bifrost to travel from realm to realm or really from planet to planet. The rainbow bridge is the pathway from one dimension to another. And you have to go through the quote unquote prism or the delta to get from one dimension to another dimension. This is another symbol to show that the Mjolnir or the hammer of Thor was always associated with the swastika or the so brothers i also want to mention this pivotal scene in the film avengers endgame and of course the still shot that i'm showing here is not from avengers endgame it's from avengers age of ultron but the reason why i'm showing this photo is because it's some predictive programming for what would occur in avengers endgame that being captain america having the ability to wield Mjolnir, thor's hammer and the reason why he was able to do so in Avengers Endgame is because of the growth of his character from the time of Age of Ultron all the way to Endgame. That being that from Captain America First Avenger, not only did he grow as a soldier, but he grew as a person. He started out as someone who believed that he was fighting for the side of right because he was on the side of America. And by the time Avengers Endgame came around, he was much more nuanced. He had a far higher degree of understanding. And therefore, he was far purer of heart. And what made Captain America Captain America from the very start was not the super soldier serum. It was the purity of his heart. That's why when the doctor, I believe his name is Dr. Erskine, after he had injected the super soldier serum into Steve Rogers and he became Captain America and the Hydra agent blew up the laboratory and shot Dr. Erskine as he laid on the ground dying, he pointed to Steve Rogers' chest to let him know 
what was special about him. It was not the super soldier serum. It was his heart. It was his spirit that made him special. But over the process of time, becoming an agent, first for the U.S. government, the U.S. Army, and later on for S.H.I.E.L.D., he was no longer as pure. But essentially, intrinsically, that nature was still in him. So when he tried to pick up the hammer, it moved a little bit because of his core nature. But he'd been sullied by what he became involved in. By the time of Avengers Endgame, he had disavowed himself from a lot of these, you know, these veneers, these facades. And Thor's hammer, therefore, could sense that all of his motives were pure. With the understanding that after the end of that final battle against Thanos, Captain America was going to hang it up. Thor's hammer sensed all that. That's why it allowed itself to be wielded by Captain America. And that's exactly what happened. He had to have a completely pure heart to wield the hammer. Even Tony Stark, he showed a purity of heart at the end. That's why he was able to utilize the gauntlet, knowing that he was going to be destroyed. So everyone knows who this character is. This is the quote-unquote Incredible Hulk. And I think that most brothers know who the ancient quote-unquote deity he's supposed to be an allusion to is. That being the great god of war, who's also known as the Green Man, a.k.a. Asar or Osiris who is the comedic god of the underworld he's also the god of transformation he's the god of rebirth as well quote unquote rebirth and as we can see in the film Avengers Endgame Bruce Banner has been reborn he's found a way to bring together the physique of the Hulk and the mind of Bruce Banner to make almost a perfect version of himself he's been reborn and there are various moments in the film where Bruce Banner comes to the revelation that he clearly was born for a certain purpose. His purpose was to wield the Infinity Gauntlet because the Infinity Gauntlet gives off the same type of radiation, gamma radiation, as was used to bring about the gift that he was given of being able to turn into the Incredible Hulk. So now we have the character of Dr. Stephen Strange, the quote unquote Sorcerer Supreme. We know where he comes from and we know what he represents. He represents this society's infatuation with quote unquote oriental or eastern religions. That being Buddhism and a lot of the occultic aspects of the eastern religions like Hinduism, Buddhism, so on and so forth. The character of Doctor Strange was actually inspired by a TV show and the character on the TV show from the 1930s and 40s called Chandu the Magician. This is that character right here. And on the show, they would depict him as being a master of astral projection, of a lot of yogic meditation, telepathy, telekinesis, things of that nature. It's very clear that <laughs> it's very clear that Stan Lee was inspired by numerous sources, all based in the occult or the, the pagan mythologies or the comedic Babylonian mystery school system to, you know, to form this quote unquote superhero league which is really just the return of the pagan gods, so on and so forth. All right, so brothers, when this film first came out back in 2018, I believe it was, I did a two-part video on this, on this film. Of course, I'm talking about the Black Panther. And I stated in the review that the Black Panther was meant to be some type of incarnation of the quote-unquote God Heru, the son of Asar and Aset. And the deeper you delve into the true meaning behind the Black Panther, of course, when you go into the comic book version, it tells you that he's of a long line of Black Panthers or Black Panther, <laughs> as they say in the film. And the goddess that they worship is Bastet. Well, of course, the actual so-called Black Panther or the inspiration for the Black Panther character from ancient Kemet, his mother was Bastet and his father was Pata, the creator god. And that entity was known as Ma'ahiz or Ma'ahez or Ma'ahez, Ma the lion-headed god of war. Because before she was Bastet, she was Sekhmet. And we know that Sekhmet is the lioness. She's the lion goddess. And of course, she is ferocious. That represents her war altar. And they brought forth the son, her, and Ptah, that being Ma'ahez, who was always depicted as having the head of a lion. 
this is that entity right here it's just another version of Heru that's all that is in the same way that the Pharaoh stated that they were of the direct descent of Heru or Horus that is who the Black Panthers represent or the Black Panther whoever takes on that name in the line of of men in Wakanda as I stated Wakanda is is a metaphor for ancient Kemet that's all it is So, brothers, we all know who this is. This is the toxically feminine character known as Captain Marvel. And as I stated in the video that I did on Captain Marvel, she's a modern version of the ancient Sumerian quote-unquote goddess known as Inanna, or the Queen of Heaven. And she's represented by the eight-pointed stars we can see here. <laughs> this character is just so obnoxious. And I see, I see this person being the death knell for the MCU. It's not going to show now because the MCU is operating according to a high level of inertia. In other words, an object that's in motion is likely to stay in motion. Right now, the MCU is like a snowball rolling downhill. It's turning into an avalanche. But now that Endgame has, you know, has been completed, and so many of the top male characters have either been killed off or degraded to the point where you no longer look at them with any element of respect or regard, now they're going to try to move towards the veneration of the feminine principle or the quote-unquote divine feminine and this character here is meant to be at the vanguard of that she is Inanna the queen of heaven okay so brothers this is Inanna this is the Sumerian quote-unquote queen of heaven the mother goddess from the sky in her dark aspect she was known as Eresh Kigel the ruler of the underworld and as we can see here in the top left there's the eight-pointed star. She later became known as Ishtar, also known as Aphrodite to the so-called Greeks or quote-unquote Greeks, also known as Durga or Kali to the Hindus. But that is who the character of Captain Marvel is meant to represent, a modern version of the Queen of Heaven, also known as Inanna. Now, brothers, as I've already stated, the character of Iron Man or Tony Stark is the great inventor, the great technology expert, the artificer, so on and so forth. He is the modernized Hephaestes or Vulcan. And in the ancient mythologies, he was always linked with Aphrodite, the quote-unquote goddess of love. That is played by Gwyneth Paltrow in the Iron Man series. And as we can see here, he is infatuated with her. She's always at odds with him. The only difference is that in the MCU... The, the constant back and forth, the arguing between Iron Man and, and Gwyneth Paltrow's character Pepper Potts is the same as how Hephaestus would argue with Aphrodite. The difference is the reasoning behind it. In the ancient Greek mythologies, Aphrodite would always cheat on Hephaestus with Ares. And therefore, Ares and Hephaestus or Vulcan would always be at odds with each other fighting one another. And as I've already stated... The character of Ares or Mars is played in the MCU by Captain America. So that explains the constant antipathy in the MCU between Iron Man and Captain America. It's just that they had to make the reasoning different because Captain America is someone who has high moral values, things of that nature. As we can see here, there's a constant beef between Iron Man and Captain America, a.k.a. Vulcan and Mars. It's just that they changed the reasoning behind it. And on top of that, due to excellent plotting and, and script writing throughout the majority of the films in the MCU, they were able to reveal, at least surreptitiously, the moment when Black Widow handed over the, the Winter Soldier's file to Captain America. Captain America, of course, read the file and then understood that the Winter Soldier is the person who killed Tony's parents. So now he was, you know, he was in a catch-22 because he knew that with Hephaestus or Vulcan's temper, if he was to find out, he would try to kill the Winter Soldier who was Captain America's best friend. So that was excellent writing, as for the most part, there was excellent writing in the MCU until the Me Too movement, the, the social justice warrior era that we've had the last two years, where they've made concerted attempts to make sure that they, that they highlight and spotlight women in these movies for whatever reason. And as I've already stated... You should have strong female characters, but when you when you make them inordinately strong, just for the sake of doing so, 
you're going to alienate your audience eventually. And no matter how many times these people do this and they get rebuked for it, they never learn. Why is that? It's because they want the masses to worship the mother goddess. So, brothers, one of the last things that I want to touch on that I definitely want to address is the planet Vormir, which is where anyone had to go if they wanted to acquire the quote unquote soul stone. And notice, once again, in these films, they let the audiences know what the entertainment industry is actually about. It's just it's just one huge grove. That's all it is. It's one huge witch coven. And and they always feel compelled to let you in on what it actually takes to get to the top, to become an elite level participant in the entertainment industry. It's just that they show you and most people don't pick up on it. So anyway, in order for you to acquire the soul stone, you have to go to the planet Vormir and you have to go in between the two giant pillars and make a sacrifice and not just a regular sacrifice, but of a person that you love. They're letting you know what the entertainment industry is about and what the craft is about. In order for you to get what you want, you have to give up a soul, the soul of someone, really your own soul, but also the flesh and blood of someone that you love. And that's what goes on in the entertainment industry for people who ascend to a higher level. They become pansexuals and they have to sacrifice someone that they love. And that, that's what was depicted in both Avengers Infinity War when Thanos sacrificed his daughter Gamora and also in Avengers Endgame. When the Black Widow sacrificed herself so that Clint, a.k.a. Hawkeye, could get the Soul Stone. But pay attention to the Twin Pillars because that is ritualistic. You have to go through the Twin Pillars to make a sacrifice because beyond the Twin Pillars is a portal to another dimension. You understand? That's why they, that's why they had the great sacrifice known as 9-11. The Twin Towers were the Twin Pillars, Boaz and Yakin. You understand that? It occurred on 9-11 because after that, everything was going to change. The world was going to change. They were going to initiate a quote-unquote new world order. But the concept of the Twin Towers or the Twin Pillars is always meant to represent both passing into another dimension and also a blood sacrifice that is necessary. I just want to add some context to the statement that I made pertaining to the twin pillars on the planet Vormir. For many of you cats who might go back <laughs> to a film from the mid 70s, mid to late 70s, it was a remake of the classic film King Kong. And it culminated with King Kong being killed or sacrificed right atop the twin pillars of the Twin Towers. Of course, in the original King Kong, he had to climb up the phallus known as the Empire State Building. But to update it and to show the, the entertainment industry's growing understanding of the Babylonian Kemetic Mystery School system, they had King Kong get killed or sacrificed right atop or right in between the Twin Pillars or the Twin Towers. As we can see here in this promotional poster for the film, King Kong is, is astride the Twin Towers as he's about to be killed and shot down. Okay, so brothers, just to delve a bit deeper into the theme of the Twin Towers or the Twin Pillars acting as a gateway to another dimension and the stipulation for your ability to access the spiritual energies from the other dimension is for you to bring forth a sacrifice. This musical group here, Super Tramp, is very clearly uh, among the initiated into the craft because as we can see from this album cover, they depict this quote-unquote waitress here, dressed in orange. The orange is the color for illumination. It represents the sun or enlightenment. And they have her here cast as the quote-unquote Statue of Liberty, also known as Libertas or Columbia. They have the orange juice as a replacement for the divine flame that she holds. So it's very clear that Super Tramp and whoever the musical artists are that comprise that group are certainly in the know per se. And as we can see, the orange or the orange juice is juxtaposed to the Twin Towers. So <laughs> it's very obvious it can't get much clearer than that. That Twin Towers or Twin Pillars, they have a divine resonance, at least to those who are in the craft on the left-hand side. 
And that's the reason why the Twin Towers were brought down. It was to open up a portal to bring forth more demonic energies to maintain the rulership of the powers that be in this society. There's a whole nother world that exists that the masses of people don't know about. And in order for the continuance of the rulers of this world to, to perpetuate what they're doing, the masses have to stay, you know, in a form of sleep, so on and so forth. But now we're in the age of information. And it's very difficult for certain sentiments not to be brought forth, especially for those who, who know what they're looking at, so on and so forth. But once again, when we see the planet Vormir, that was them telling on themselves. They were trying to inform you that within the craft, yes, there must be a sacrifice performed in order for you to acquire the quote unquote soul stone, which is metaphorical for success. You have to give away your soul in order to get success in the craft or in the industry or a place of prominence in this world, so on and so forth. When I say prominence, I'm talking about within that sphere of the entertainment industry. Now, this is a classic film that we all know. But <laughs> like they say, when you know better, you do better. When you know more, you see more. We see here with the film Die Hard, the classic themes of black, white, and red. Die Hard, of course, is in blood red. We have the Nakatomi Plaza. And it's depicted here almost like it's two towers, even though we see it's just one. And the right side of Bruce Willis's face is, is blacked out. It's only the left eye that we see for the mother goddess. And on top of the tower, it's in flames for the sacrifice. So brothers, right here is the true meaning of the term Endgame. This is what the film Avengers Endgame is truly about. It's the end of, <laughs> of any form of male authority aspect in the MCU. Everything from here on in is going to be equal billing between the male star and the female star even if people do not particularly care about that so-called female star they're going to force the feminine principle on you until you vomit it up and the producers of the marvel cinematic universe start to see a decline in the revenue which they're going to see because at the end of the day iron man captain america thor those were the most captivating figures in the marvel cinematic universe even black panther but just compare how the Black Panther character was depicted in Captain America Civil War. Strong, authoritative, focused to how he was depicted in the film Black Panther. All for the sake of exalting the, the female characters in the film who were all strong, never confused. If you pay very close attention, the female characters in these films are almost never conflicted. Very rarely are they conflicted in anything. Now the Black Widow was a bit conflicted because she was an assassin. So she had to come to terms with the fact that not only was she privy to many secrets that tested her quote-unquote morality, but also that she was willing to kill anyone just to fulfill her mission. So she had to deal with that aspect. And Loki preyed on that in the first Avengers film. But for the most part, all the female characters on these, in these films are never conflicted. When you look at Ant-Man, the character of the Wasp, she's never conflicted. She's so strong mentally. She's a great teacher. She's a, she's a great martial artist. She's everything. The Ant-Man is, is confused as hell. Tony Stark is confused as hell. But Pepper Potts is never confused about anything. <laughs> Captain America sometimes is confused. But then he has his sister Athena there with him. The, the, uh, the Black Widow there to calm him. So on and so forth. Now you have the character of the Vision. Who was linked up with the Scarlet Witch. She was forced to show that she was conflicted because she was dealing with an android. There's no conflict for an android, but had she been linked with a human being, then it would have been the man who was conflicted and not her. Remember, the Black Widow was also linked with the Incredible Hulk character. Of course, the Incredible Hulk was conflicted. She was not. So you have to watch for those things because that's how they subconsciously tried to program you to believe that women are this way and men are that way. Men are always confused. Women are never confused. They're trying, to, they're trying to put themselves under mind control because they know in reality that's not the case. But once again, this is where the Marvel Cinematic Universe is heading towards. And that moment near the end of Avengers Endgame, where they felt the need to, sh to show all these women lined up and say, we got this. 
Like th that would never have been done for any other demographic. Like, I mean, me as a so-called black man, if they would have had a scene where the Black Panther and the Falcon and uh, War Machine or Iron Patriot, whatever you call him now, and the Dora Milaje and Suri and all of them, they all lined up and said, Black Power, we're going <laughs> to... We're going to carry the Infinity Gauntlet for black power. I would have said, what is this bullshit? Are you fighting a war or are you trying to be a social justice warrior in the midst of, of Armageddon? Like, what the fuck is going on? But just the fact that they felt the need to put that, to sprinkle that bullshit in there shows you how much of a concerted attempt they're going to be making and pushing the feminine principle in these oncoming films. And that's the real end game. It's the same dynamic that, that we've seen in the Star Wars universe for those of you who pay attention to that. The first thing that they did in the Force Awakens film was kill off Han Solo because Han Solo represented quote unquote toxic masculinity. He was a masculine character who was unrepentant for who he was. Remember he would call Princess Leia toots and all that and all that other stuff. Remember she told him I love you and he responded and he responded back I know. He didn't even say I love you back. See there's no more room for those type of characters in in film anymore. Because Hollywood is basically ran by Disney. And Disney is all about witchcraft and pansexuality and the exaltation of the mother goddess principle. So, cats have to watch for that. We see they killed off Iron Man. They're all set to replace him with his daughter. Ant-Man, all set to be replaced by his daughter. Thor is fat and sloppy and confused, even though he's supposedly a god. He's going to be replaced by the lesbian Valkyrie, played by Tessa Thompson. Right? Even in the film Logan, in the other splinter of the, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, they got rid of Wolverine, replaced him with what? His daughter. So that's what they're doing now. Because they know that nobody wants to see chick flicks. You, you can't program people through chick flicks because nobody wants to see that shit. So now they're going to try to invade the comic book world with the toxic femininity and, and, you know, try to spell cast on the young boys and make them think that girls are stronger than them and smarter than them. And this is what we're going to see or what anyone who sees these films is going to see for as long as the Marvel Cinematic Universe remains until it gets nipped in the bud. But anyway, overall, if I were to evaluate the Avengers Infinity War and Endgame films out of five scrolls, I would give it overall, I would give it four. Four out of five scrolls, just because of the performances of of uh, Robert Downey Jr., Chris Evans, so on and so forth. They always knock it out the park. They do a great job. I wish that the character of the Black Panther had a more prominent role. But once again, in this modern world that we live in, the so-called black man has to put his foot down. And cats are scared to put their foot down because the so-called black man has allowed himself to be put behind women. You understand? So that's what that's about. But once again, I would give it four out of five stars. Where would I rank it amongst the greatest films in the history of the Marvel Cinematic Universe? Number one for me will always be Captain America Civil War. In my view, that's the best MCU film ever made. Right behind that is Captain America Winter Soldier. After that is Avengers 1. And then so on and so forth. After that, I mean, the films are very good after that. But those were the three tremendously great films in my view. Infinity War and Endgame were both good, to maybe very good, but they were both a bit too long. I think that they gave the they gave the Russo brothers a little bit too much space when it comes to the editing. They should have either made it a trilogy or edited it a little bit better, especially Endgame. Endgame has about 20 minutes of footage that was not necessary, especially around the start of the film. Like, you know, there were certain scenes that were just not necessary and no disrespect. Some of those close-up scenes with Scarlett Johansson, I could have done without. Because she is no longer a looker at all. I mean, she looked, she looked like she just woke the fuck up after doing a whole bunch of heroin. I mean, she looked crazy in that movie. But anyway, peace.